Hello all, this is the Owl, and hell yeah, at last we're at the bit you've all been waiting for. Which, oddly enough, is what I'll be saying next video too. Volume 8 of Maiden Abyss is… a lot. I will admit that on my first time through this, back in ye olden days of this channel, damn it past Owl your audio was bad, I didn't have a good time with it. Just too damn dark and bleak, even by Made in Abyss standards. And yet, while I was dreading it this time around, especially as someone who recently became a girl dad, I actually kind of enjoyed it. Who knows, maybe I've become desensitized thanks to all of the stuff I read for you sickos. Huh. However, I actually suspect that it's because Volume 8 is, at its core, one of my favourite genres of horror story, and not one we see outside of maybe sci-fi or found footage. The so-called Doomed Expedition. And yes, I have seen the terror about a dozen times, thanks. Oh, one very quick thing before we start. I was debating how to handle Volume 8 as there's just a lot to talk about here. Initially, I was going to split it into three videos, but I already hate splitting these into two. Then I considered doing one big video, but at present my ancient PC starts dying if I do one longer than an hour with any sort of effects whatsoever. And as the next video is going to be a chonker already, no. So yeah, we're doing a two-parter again, which is where Volume 8 might be a bit annoying. See, Part 1 will be the slow stuff, although hopefully interesting. And Part 2, Part 2 is where we go insane and get to the dark stuff. We will get there. Regardless, we've got some absolutely bizarre ground to cover today, so let's dive on in. We re-enter the story, with Fueko finally explaining to Rikom and Co exactly what's been going on here, how she wound up in a Shogat's butthole, and well, we begin to learn about the secret history of the village. Yes, Volume 8 is where we will be slowly but surely teasing apart the mysteries of the second season slash arc, but particularly how an entire village of hollows, closer to blessed hollows, as opposed to the wretched mutants the Layer 6 curse tends to produce, could exist and exactly what the village is. We start out observing a young Vueco fiddling with a star compass and dreaming wistfully of where it could lead her. Yes, this draws a pretty interesting parallel between Vueco and Rico, except that in Vueco's case, it points out over the sea. I also want to point out that Volume 8 is where the art goes from amazing to mind-blowing, and it really does just get better from there. We learn that she… okay, let's get this out of the way, my explanation of Volume 8 is going to be a bit all over the place, and it might come over a touch stop start, as it'll tie back into what we've already encountered in the village, which I will point out as it comes up, and Vueco's backstory is Doflamingo levels of messed up. She was ostensibly an orphan, taken in by an utter bastard of a man called Juroimo. Yes, observant folks may recall that this name is identical to the third sage slash village guardian slash I guess Freudian monstrosity that we encountered previously. We will talk more about this in volume 9 as there's a lot of implication and inference there, but short version, for reasons unknown besides, yeah, bastard, he abused a young Vueco in about every way you can imagine, and some you probably can't, or at least don't want to. Much of it involves a hot poker. The worst of it is not shown graphically, but again, what we do see is pretty ghastly, and what is implied later on is so much worse. And as we learn, it left her sterile. 
Judo Imo obtained the compass after his fishing boat found a stricken ship full of mostly dead people in horrific and bizarre conditions. One was split in two, as if he'd just lost a match against Kung Lao, but is still somehow alive, and another had violently prolapsed her organs out through her neck. I still don't fully understand why this all happened. The common theory on the Discord is that they were experimenting with relics, although I wonder if this might have been a result of a battle with the Abyssal natives who employed relics as weapons. If you know, let us know in the comments. The only survivor had gone stark, staring at the wall mad raving about a giant pit with a golden city in its depths. Very Herman Melville in a way, and he then died. Vuekor, perhaps naturally, dreamed of escaping, travelling over the sea to follow the compass and find some sort of light in her life, and also to escape Judo Imo. After one incident where he, I think, I think the implication here is that he killed, cooked, and forced her to eat her beloved pet fox, although he maybe just killed it. She does exactly that. Despite the horrors of her home life, the Wicko trained herself and was eventually able to join a so-called suicide mission to follow the compass and locate the Golden City on an expedition. Part of a sizable flotilla led by the eccentric so-called Prophet Wazukyan. He's a vibe for such an important and respected man. He speaks in a very informal, laid-back way, and he also believes in a religious sense that Fueko bringing the compass to him was part of some great and divinely appointed destiny to seek out a legendary golden city, and as we will learn later, this will allegedly allow them to somehow transcend their human forms. It's pretty ambiguous though, and I may well be wrong. We also meet Captain Hitsugaya, I mean Belaf. No, seriously, the designs are just uncannily similar. A good looking and amicable young man. I think he's implied to be Wazukyan's second, and also believes deeply in the man, once again in a religious sense, saying, that he is someone touched by the divine and blessed with the power of prophecy, hence his moniker. Together, the chosen child Vueko, Belaf the disciple, and Wazukian the prophet make up the so-called three sages of this quasi-religious expedition. There's actually a lot of religious stuff in this arc. I mean, even the three sages remind me of the Trinity. It's pretty interesting if you look closer, and it suggests that Tsukushi is pretty damn smart and is writing this on multiple levels, or that I read too much into things. Anyways, we see Belaf waffling on about, yeah, I have no idea what's going on here. He's an odd one, but he's also a genuinely good and gentle man, although he does seem to have a mild thing about eyes, and everyone comments on just how lovely his are. Oh, thanks, Freddy Foreshadowing. Now, before we go any further, one quick thing. I am not going to talk too much about the ecology of Layer 6 here, or the fairly obvious references to certain famous actual doomed expeditions, particularly those to find El Dorado or Zin. I have done two videos on these topics already, and while those videos are older so yeah sorry Hmong audio, you can go and watch those there. All except for one thing, which we'll get to a bit later. Anyways, their journey continued, with most of the fleet being lost and only two ships remaining. But at the end, they do eventually reach their destination, the Abyss. They head ashore, and yeah, they have no idea what they're in for. They enter the area near the Abyss and encounter a group of natives. And yes, as the whole vaguely, let's call it Portuspantalian vibe going on here, coupled with the ships and definite echoes of Manifest Destiny, there's a lot to unpack here. Although, as always, I may well be reaching. 
we do actually get what might well be a not this, as someone that seems to be a village elder tells them that the colonists and explorers who have come before them were not especially nice. Are they referring to the ship Judo Imo found? And oh right, do note that the language they're speaking is the same as the tongue used by the Iduburu Hollows. Huh. Regardless, he has some sort of super freakout when Vueko approaches a young girl. Although, as Belaf translates, it turns out that he's actually talking about the Star Compass, referring to it with great excitement in your standard cryptic Tsukushi fashion. He calls it a precious thing, and the form of the essential part a key maybe? I have no idea. Regardless, he is willing to help them on their way, provided they give him the compass. Weird how these always seem to get lost in some fashion upon entering the abyss. With some reluctance, she agrees, and they learn that a golden city called Shoro, which I actually went down a bit of a rabbit hole on, and thanks to Pooty Spaghetti and a few other folks, I found something very very interesting happening here, something that I never picked up on my first time through, so you guessed it, it's time for a bonus round. Enjoy! When I last covered this, I thought that Shoro was a pretty simple nod to El Dorado and similar lost cities, but it actually gets more interesting from there. See, Shoro is, in a lot of respects, an almost definite reference to Shambhala. If that name sounds vaguely familiar, you're probably familiar with it as either a somewhat obscure mythical city, but more likely as the Wi-Fi password for aspiring sorcerers. Now, this is going to be a massive oversimplification, as some of you have indeed asked me to keep these tangents under control, but in a nutshell, it's usually portrayed as a city, although some legends do speak of it as a land, an entire country, or a whole plane of existence. It nonetheless forms an important part, not only of certain Eastern religions, but also, bizarrely enough, some forms of Western occultism, in particular theosophy, and there's your word for the day. However, I would guess most of you have encountered it yourselves in some media or another under a different name, Shangri-La. Some stories place it in the Himalayas, others place it in deep Siberia, and it has been the subject of several fascinating, but sadly not well documented international expeditions to locate, including one involving occultists Helena and Nicholas Rorich, one by the KGB as part of their goal to uncover the secrets of ESP, no I'm not kidding, and even the bloody Nazis due to Hitler's own alleged obsession with the occult. Now, the story of Shambhala is very complicated and full of words that I would really struggle to pronounce even with a guide. But in a nutshell, in very ancient times, a king who followed Buddhist doctrines exiled a large number of his people for worshipping the sun. He later wished for them to return and invited them back, but many refused. Instead, they established a marvelous city called Shambhala, I guess analogous to Atlantis. And yeah, perceptive viewers may immediately recall the title of Season 2, Ritsujitsu no Ogenkyo, The Golden City of the Scorching Sun. Yeah, that's either a huge coincidence, or we're cracking the code here, folks. Now, where this does potentially get even more interesting is that there is a prophecy in some Buddhist texts that when the world enters its Dark Age, a new Buddha will emerge from Shambhala with an army to fight the forces of evil and will usher in an approximately 2,000 year long golden age. And if that timeline sounds familiar, it lines up very, 
very well with the cycles mentioned in Maiden Abyss, which is interesting. Anyways, just some food for thought. The Gunja Expedition prepares to depart down into the abyss, only for a young girl to approach Fueko, begin to sniff her, and then seemingly start to follow her around. Yes, she looks sad, and yes, she is also drawn in a way as to be aggressively cute. Belaf inspects her, seeing that she has been cruelly tattooed on her back with abyssal glyphs, these indicate that she is infertile and thus has been exiled to die in the abyss. Woof! Likely due to her own sterility, not to mention extensive scarring due to the abuse she endured as a child. The Wickle immediately takes pity on her, while the other expedition members are really unwilling to waste energy and resources protecting someone young and vulnerable. The Wekko is able to persuade them, with the help of the compassionate Wazukian, to let her come along as some sort of ersatz guide. And the girl quickly proves that she's not ersatz at all. In fact, she's indispensable. After an expedition member attempts to ascend on layer 1 and begins puking and rolling around, she is able to explain that he was sickened by the curse and assists them with survival in this hostile environment. They head further down encountering all sorts of dangerous monsters and other threats, and losing members at a steady clip, but are still steadfast on their goal as some sort of divinely appointed mission to seek, down deep in the dark, the Golden City. Eventually, they arrive on layer 6, having taken the elevator down, presumably from what would later become Edo Front, and before you ask, it's not incredibly clear, and yes, this does just raise further questions, but they were able to use the elevator thanks to a bizarre Deus Ex Hollow with a white whistle. I guess it's not really important, but I would love to know what the hell happened there. Regardless, at the bottom, they are, yeah, this is just really interesting. They are met by four interference units, you know, what Gaburuon is, who appear to be guiding them to the Golden City. Only, as they arrive, one of the units is snagged by what turns out to be an absolutely leviathan creature. One that would dwarf even a turbanid dragon. No, seriously, what even is this thing, and why have we never seen it again? It's just insanely cool. There is some speculation that this might just be an enormous version of a Hon Murodoko, but it may also just be a species that went extinct between the Ganja expeditions and Riko's descent. Anyways, believing that the units led them into a trap despite, you know, one of their number being the first to be attacked, they bind them up, but the units explain that they are not residents of the city. They are simply designed to explore the abyss and learn, which is interesting, as it implies that they are gathering knowledge for someone or something further down. Yes, remember for the sake of these videos, we mostly pretend that nothing further than the current arc has been written, except when it's convenient or really, really funny. Now, this next bit is pretty abstract, but also important. We learn that the Ganja expedition, which yes, I am not going to make the obvious joke here, mostly because no matter how I trimmed it, Dr. Green Thumb kept getting claimed. They came down here due to some legend about those who found the city being able to transcend their humanity, as I mentioned earlier. Once again, there's a lot of religious theming in this arc, and in Buddhism, transcending your humanity is kind of the whole deal. However, they quickly learn that, while this land is far more dangerous than they had anticipated, escape is impossible. 
any attempts results in them getting slapped with the layer 6 curse and thus getting mittied, reduced to a miserable hollow which seems to be outright fatal some of the time, and when it's not, let's just say that whoever survives probably wish they hadn't. Again, note the contrast between blessed hollows like the Nachi and these wretched creatures. They are able to establish some sort of settlement within the city, despite their situation becoming pretty dire. Supplies are starting to run low, and dangerous fauna make exploration and foraging difficult. Water is in fact becoming the primary issue, and thus their fledgling village asks the interference units if they know where some water source could be found. They say that there are indeed some, but the routes to and from them are rather dangerous. Regardless, they do their best to survive in this new and inhospitable promised land, and it kind of works, for a time. And yes, that last sentence had a hook on it bigger than Daniel Robitaille, let's take a look. As time elapses, the struggling settlement, well, settles in, with Belaf, Vueco and everyone else teaching the young native girl, who we learn is called, yup, there it is, Irem Yui, their tongue. And I assume everyone learning some of the abyssal tongue too. We get some pretty interesting information, as she tells them that the natives tattoo themselves in imitation of those who resided in the now empty and destroyed Golden City. Although, with the temporal distortions down this low, it's difficult to place a timeline here. This is one aspect of Volume 8 that genuinely fascinates me. This allusion to some sort of ancient people that resided in Shoreor and, by my guess, were pretty advanced. They are interrupted by a shout from outside, only to see that a small rabbit-like creature has taken up residence in a helmet. I actually thought this was a Neritantan for the longest time, but it's a distinct species known, quite endearingly, as a hermit rat, strongly resembling a hermit crab in that it likes to wear a shell of some sort. This little critter absolutely charms Vueko and Idem Yui, while people who've read this thing before, yeah, just seeing this creature and knowing what's coming, hairs should be rising on the backs of your necks. Anyway, while she is a tiny bit reluctant, recalling her dead pet, Vueko hugs Idem Yui. Yeah, they bonding, and yeah, this bit gets me right in the sodding feels every single time. Far, far too wholesome by half. While there is some overall objection to keeping a settlement pet, with supplies running as low as they are, particularly in terms of water, Wazukian agrees because A, it's adorable, and B, it might well be useful, as it must be finding food and water somewhere nearby to have survived. I don't think this is ever explored though. To solve the water problem, with the help of the interference units, the Gunja folk isolate five possible sources. Two of these lie within the territory of some very dangerous creatures, so dangerous in fact that even the units need to avoid them, and this leaves three that do seem safer to approach. Thus, the Gunja set off on three separate scouting missions to investigate these. However, to their frustration, they discover that one is a reeking toxic mess, and the other is a lethally hot thermal zone, leaving only the final one innocuous enough in a bed of rock, which they naturally immediately gravitate to. Now, yeah, folks who know a thing or two about survival in the wild would spot a serious warning sign here, but I will leave it to you in the comments to see if anyone else notices it. Very curious to see what you come up with. Regardless, they do take precautions in regards to the water. They inspect it and then boil it before consumption and, 
with a source established, the Ganja settlement slowly but surely becomes more solid, as its residents become adjusted to life on layer 6. And while they do continue to lose members here and there, presumably the weaker or unlucky ones, they are able to hunt for meat and thus have food and water. We also learn that, oh yeah, the reason Idem Yui was drawn to Vueko was her scent, which Idem Yui describes as the smell of mating with lots of people. Yeah, okay, there's a lot to unpack here. We will get into this later on, and let's say it goes to some really, really dark places. But we learn that Idem Yui's mother was of high importance to her tribe due to her extreme fertility while she was deemed cursed and forced into the abyss. We see the two bonding further, becoming very much mother and daughter, with Irem Yui revealing her core desire. She wants to be needed and never discarded again, likely quite similar to Vueko's own feelings. Damn it, Tsukushi, you utter bastard. This is heart-wrenching stuff knowing what's coming. Regardless, Vueko in turn realizes that this is what she came over the ocean to find, a child, someone to love her and for her to love. We get an absolutely gorgeous montage showing us the further passage of time, as well as stuff that happened in the settlement including, oh man, there is a lot going on here so let's go from the top. First up, they all became quite skilled hunters catching the best I can do is penis bird. We actually see the important stuff though a bit below. Next, Vueko and another girl, who we will later learn is called Pakoyan, became lovers and yeah, this is the infamous panel of them bumping lady bits, which was naturally completely excluded from the anime. That said, as important as Pakuyan is going to be later in the story, this is one of the few areas where I think season 2 of the anime does outdo the manga, as, well, we get to see more of her. More tragically, however, we see that Irem Yui's pet hermit rat gets eaten by another Hon Murutoko, albeit a much smaller specimen, and this completely traumatizes her as it would. However, Fueko makes her a necklace out of the little creature's bones, which, okay, that seems kind of unhealthy to me, but it does apparently cheer her up somehow, and ah, even Belaf is happy for them. Again, wholesome as hell. Time moves on until we start gradually dipping a toe into probably the darkest stuff in the entire manga. Be warned, things are about to get pretty damn horrible. One morning, Vueko is woken by Pakoyan and reaches over to rouse Irem Yui, only to realize that, oh hell, something is very, very wrong with her. She's feverish, barely conscious, and suffering from extreme diarrhea that just so happens to be full of insect larvae. They find other members of the settlement, all suffering from a similar ailment, only way worse. Their flesh is starting to first melt and then ossify into almost rock-like formations. Wazukian tells Belaf to get to the bottom of this and as a recent foraging and exploration party sent into the city seems to be suffering the worst and most rapid onset symptoms, they are able to track the disease to its source. Naturally, this is the waterhole. What they thought was rock is in fact the melted and petrified remains of countless creatures and… okay yeah, I will just explain this here. The water is, in fact, a bizarre creature in its own right. A lot like that silver blood stuff from Voyager, but rather than cloning stuff it lures in, this stuff gets creatures to drink it, then it melts them and somehow this is both likely how it propagates itself, hence the larvae, 
and how it feeds. And they've all been drinking this stuff. Lots of it. For months now. Oh dear. On top of this, while exploring the city, the now dead party found a strange relic in the form of an egg. And this, if you are closely observant, also bears the same mark that the Star Compass does. This thing, spoiler, is going to be bloody important. The three sages are also unsure of how to proceed from here. It appears to be a perfect no-win scenario. If they continue drinking what they now refer to as pseudo-water, they'll melt. Otherwise, well, they could always die of thirst. Wazukian, strangely enough, does not seem concerned though, pointing out that not all of them are sick, meaning that they have time to figure out something. He goes over and speaks with the interference units, asking them if they know what the relic that the foraging party returned with is all about. They are informed that this is a crazy powerful one. Simply carrying it delayed the effects of the pseudo water, although I'm not sure of this. I guess the implication is that once they relinquished it, the symptoms came on really fast. But they also say, in their words, that round relics are related to wishes and... Okay, so this thing is known as the Cradle of Desire. And it's very Clive Barker, or maybe the original reality stone from the Marvel comics, before they nerfed it for the movie. It's also one of my favorite elements within the manga, because it's just so damn cool and so damn terrifying. You'll see what I mean. This thing grants your desires and wishes, not a spoken wish. It reads you and gives you what you want, deep down in your own mind, or at least what it thinks that you think you want, all of it, at once, as best as it can interpret. And while that may sound bloody amazing, it's actually incredibly dangerous for an adult, because, see, adult minds are murky and full of conflicting thoughts and weird whims, and this means that the cradle, let's say you hold it, and are thinking at the same time, you wish that you were taller, that you had more money, that your dead girlfriend was back alive, and that you could really go for a burger. You know, the sort of thunderstorm of thoughts that were constantly rolling through our noggins at all times. Well, you'd probably wind up as a six foot tall golden statue of a hamburger that now has a rotting zombie girlfriend sticking out of its torso. And that's the best I can do. What would really happen would probably be way worse than this. Very monkey's paw in its way. The units continue to explain saying that due to this, a child is a much better candidate for using the cradle, as their minds are less busy and thus less murky, and their desires are purer. However, it's still pretty dangerous. And as the only child in the settlement is Idem Yui, this makes it all very, very complicated. Fueko, thus, rather than assenting or declining, vacillates unsure of what to do next. They desperately need something to change, lest the entire settlement dies out, but of course she's reluctant to place her found daughter in danger. Yeah, better you than me. As time passes, Fueko continues to be indecisive, unsure of whether to risk harm to her daughter via the extremely powerful cradle, as the settlement continues to sicken. Caught on the horns of a really nasty little dichotomy, they need water to drink, but the more they drink, the more they disintegrate. With nobody able to forage, Food is running low too, and they've had to resort to eating local insects to survive. However, Fueko's mind is finally made up when Idem Yui's condition starts to take a significant turn for the worse. Yeah, because Tsukushi has seen into my sodding nightmares, one morning Fueko finds a 
feverish and delirious child crying out in pain, saying that her hand really hurts. Fubeko checks and sees that, oh dear, at last, Irem Yui has begun to melt herself, with her left hand looking like it had been eaten away by acid. That is Nagi. She goes to Wazukyo to inquire about the cradle and the interference units, while their naturally their normal cryptic selves say that the probability of it working is extremely high. As, okay, this I don't understand. In their words, the fears felt by the children are much closer to the origin. Again, let me know in the comments if you have the slightest idea what they mean. She allows herself a brief spate of happiness and relief as Wazukyan, overjoyed, says that he will tell the settlement and no, that's not a good face at all. He says that Irem Yui will in fact be their salvation. Yes, this is, as you youngsters would put it, rather sus, but there doesn't seem to be any other choice here. Sure enough, Fueko gives the cradle to the little girl, while recalling the decidedly off face that Wazukyan made, one that looked more in the grip of some sort of religious fervor than any sort of concern. That said, nothing seems to happen, and Irem Yui falls asleep, holding the cradle to her chest. The Weko beds down with Pakuyan, revealing in an absolutely incredibly constructed series of panels, seriously, no notes, that she herself is likely falling ill too, at last, as well as being absolutely exhausted. The next morning, she is awakened by a chipper and seemingly recovered Irem Yui, and is absolutely overjoyed. Then she sees, oh come on man, why? There is no way I can show you this at all. But Irem Yui is completely naked. Only the cradle has been absorbed into her chest and rests at its center between her breasts, like the weak spot on a boss monster. Moreover, her melted hand has not healed, but it also doesn't seem to be bothering her. Wazukyan and Belaf seem confused. The girl seems happy and healthy, but the village is no less sick. Worse yet, as Belaf points out, there's something just so very wrong here, but he cannot put his finger on it. We shift away as we see him wondering just what it was that Irem Yui wished for. And yeah, that's where we will leave off today. Yeah, yeah, sorry. If we go any further, we'll have to go on through as this is where the really dark stuff gets moving at a rapid pace and there are no other natural stopping points in that lot. You will all get to enjoy it next time. Anyways, before we finish for the day, I just want to say a huge thanks, as always, to our amazing patrons. Seriously folks, without you there is no way that we could continue to produce these videos. Cheddar, Crazy, Question Man 6, Hunting for R2D2, Inukir Koji, Kel Kor, Kali Karis, Opinion Custard, Philip Campbell, Piece of Yeast, Ranger Danger, Rose Montgomery, Wargle, The Empress, Camiolan, Cheshire Quill, Endymion, Aaron Arnolds, Fluffy Burb, Jake, Jake Ramsey, Lance Goebel, Rafferty, Riss, Simone, Squid, and Yorgborg. I also really want to thank our two Albard patrons, Jathis and Polite Crow, that is so bananas generous that I really cannot sufficiently express my gratitude. If you want to help us out and ensure that we can keep on making these videos. Why not subscribe, leave a super thanks, or best of all, head on over to our Patreon. If you do the latter, you will get all sorts of benefits, including early access to videos, patron exclusive videos, a special Discord channel, and more. You'll also get access to a thing towards the end of October. That should be pretty damn cool. If you're looking for something different, why not hit Mrs. Owl up 
for some sort of commission. She does everything from game assets to pixel art to actual art art, avatars, OCs, banners, emojis, and more. Her rates are also great. Otherwise, take care all, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.